Hey guys, before the video begins, I would like to make a very important announcement in regards to a new channel made by a friend of mine, Kelly Productions. He has created a new channel named The Watch. It's a channel dedicated to making superhero films and miniseries of a new universe that has been created and named The Watch. And the first film is out right now. If you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or even on this very channel, you know I've spoken about a film that's been involved that I've been involved with. Well, this is it. The Midnight Warden. I'd highly appreciate it if you guys subscribed to this channel, liked the video, turned on notifications, and shared this film with your friends so we can make more films in the future. The more awareness of our films, the more we can make. You can find a link to the channel in the description below of this video, or click on my channel and go to the section channels, and it will be there as we speak. And with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoy today's video. What's going on, everybody? My name is Zellbrins, and welcome back to yet another reaction. Now, today I got a video by the Infographic, and I don't really react to them that much, but I do watch a lot of their content outside of reactions. But this one caught my attention because we were talking because in a, a, a little while ago we were watching Oversimplified, and we were watching about about the Punic War. But it got me thinking about the Roman Empire and why did it collapse. So hopefully, this video does explain the full extent of why the Roman Empire did collapse. So with that being said, we're just going to go ahead and click play on this bad boy because I'm really intrigued in three, two, one, go. The Roman Empire seemed unbeatable at its peak. One of the largest empires the world had ever seen, it fended off all of its military foes. It built a complex administrative state that ruled regions from Egypt to Spain to England and yeah. as far east as modern day Iraq. At its height, it seemed like it would rule forever. And today, it's a distant memory. Why did the Roman Empire ultimately fall? Did it meet an enemy too powerful to fend off? Was it undone by an internal conflict? Or did it simply stretch itself too thin? The answer isn't any one of those, and the empire's downfall Wait, happened over hundreds of years. To find the truth really? of the Roman Empire's fall, we have to go back to well, how it became it an empire in the first place. Collapsed. Because initially, it was a republic with far less territory. The Republic had taken over from the previously flawed monarchy, but the people seemed to be calling out for a more unified government. One man was more than willing to answer that call, Julius Caesar, the man appointed perpetual mm. dictator of Rome in the mid-first century BCE. He started consolidating power, becoming a popular and effective ruler who won many military campaigns, and many of his rivals realized he had no intention of giving up his newfound power. The elites of Rome assassinated him setting off one of the biggest political crises in Roman history. Oh. Civil wars kicked off as many people sought to claim power, and in the end, the wars saw Octavian, the adopted son of Caesar, take power. He continued his father's legacy, conquering nearby territories including Egypt, ending that country's Hellenistic era. Soon, he was more powerful than his father ever was, and the Roman Senate responded accordingly. They granted him the title of Augustus, allowing him well, to I thought, rule I, was, I thought I was going to say they assassinated him because he was too powerful. Because <laughs> that's how things were back in the day. If you were too powerful, you were assassinated. Perpetuity, and soon time. no one would dare challenge his power. The plotters who feared Caesar's role as dictator had accidentally created the rise of Rome's first emperor. And he wouldn't be the last. From then, Rome would not only become another monarchy ruled by a series of hereditary leaders, both good and bad, but it would develop hunger for conquest that would envelop a large part of Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. While Italy would continue to serve as the center of the empire, Tanya. other territories would be organized wow. into provinces, each administered by a local governor with drastically different approaches to leadership. The empire would soon be so large that it would be impossible for one leader to maintain full control over every territory, which meant the provinces would still maintain some level of autonomy as long as they paid their taxes and didn't cause any problems that would arouse the ire of the emperor. And the system seemed to be working. The empire was stable enough that the next two centuries Pax became Romana. largely known Mania? as Pax Romana. Romana. But under the surface, okay. trouble was brewing. During the first century CE... Right, because the, the, the Roman Empire was far too large for so, for one single person to rule. You had to split it into like a province states and have somebody that responds to the emperor sit there and keep things under control. That's what it ended up leading to. I gotta close my window again. It's getting too cold out too quickly for my liking. There we go. Anyway, let's continue. 
religious conflicts started brewing under the surface. The Roman Empire largely worshipped the traditional pantheon, led by Jupiter and heavily tied to the Greek pantheon led by Zeus. This polytheistic faith was characterized by ornate temples dedicated to the individual gods and a wild lore that made the gods seem rather petty and human. Jupiter's dalliances with human women and gods taking revenge for the most petty grievances were both common staples of the faith in those days, and then came Christianity. Spinning out of the mm. teachings of the Jewish rabbi known as Jesus and his eventual crucifixion by the Roman authorities, this new Abrahamic faith was based off the often persecuted faith of Judaism and largely received the same treatment in the early days. While some of the more dramatic stories like early Christians being fed to lions have no historical backing, the Roman Empire saw new faiths as a threat to the establishment. But religions aren't easy to kill. The mm. conflict stayed under the radar and Christianity was mostly a small f Religion was crazy back in the day. Because if you think about it, a lot of battles and, su and such were based with uh, some sort of conflict that had to do with uh, religion back in the day. And everybody's view was so different. He was trying to convert other people to understand their religion instead of their that people's own religion. It was very confusing back in the day. Faith during those early years, and a wise emperor would have likely focused on maintaining the empire's stability rather than persecuting heathens. But when you have a monarchy, you're often relying on the whims of birth order and genetics, and in the year 177, Rome's luck ran out. The new emperor, Commodus, would soon become infamous for this exact reason. The Why? youngest emperor ever at the age of 15, his rule was dictated by his emotions which led to recklessness. A teenager making bad decisions when given too much power? Ha! Perished the thought. As he was inheriting the empire built by many of his predecessors, it was hard for him to screw up the larger things. But back in Rome, he wasted no time throwing things into chaos. He was known for his fickle and dictatorial leadership style as well as his love of the gladiator matches in the Colosseum. He would even participate in duels himself, which largely meant anyone who faced off against him would probably be expected to die quietly. He built a cult of personality around himself, and his reign was so chaotic that he would eventually be immortalized by Joaquin Phoenix as a villain in the Oscar-winning movie Gladiator. And his reign ended Ow. as it began, with chaos. Commodus was assassinated by a wrestler in Roman baths after 15 years in charge, and things would only get more chaotic from there. The Ow. Roman Senate declared him a public enemy and tore down his statues, and he was succeeded by a new emperor in what would become known as the Year of the Five Emperors. It was 193 CE and civil war ensued. The next emperor would be assassinated only three months after taking office. His successor would really? essentially pay off the guards to let him become emperor, and he would be ousted and executed only weeks later. The chaos would only die down when two emperors, Septimus Severus and Claudius Albinius, ruled simultaneously despite both considering the other to be a threat. Rome's mm. political climate was in complete chaos. So what, did they go through five emperors in roughly under five years? Is that what this is, this is supposed to mean? And soon people outside would start noticing. Many of the provinces of Rome had been semi-autonomous for a long time and had developed their own cultures. So as the Roman state spiraled into chaos, they started to wonder, why not just make it official? As the Romans struggled through a series of weak, crazy, and inconsequential emperors, often in quick succession, the territory started to break away at an increasing rate. First came the self-declared Gallic Empire, which took most of the territory of modern-day France and England with it. Then came the Palmyrene Empire, which was led by Queen Zenobia and took over much of Egypt and the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, including many key sites in the Holy Land. It was the biggest crisis in Rome's history, but it would bring many changes with it. A series of three emperors in the 3rd century would bring this crisis to an end, but the Roman Empire that emerged from it would not be the same. First was Aurelian, who only reigned for five years, but had a huge impact. At the time, really? the diminished Roman military was under attack by barbarian tribes and internal strife, and it seemed like the empire's days might be nearing an end. But Aurelian had risen through the ranks of the military and knew its workings well, and under his reign he fended off the attacking tribes and conquered both the Palmyrene Empire and the Gallic Empire. He surrounded Rome with mighty walls, abandoned provinces that were too much trouble to keep, and improved Rome's economy. Under his short hmm. tenure, Rome started to look Wait, then why did he- then why was he only an, as an emperor for like a couple of years? If he was doing that good, then what happened? More like it did at his peak. His successors would build on his work. Diocletian would reign for 20 years and was also a military veteran, but most of the military work had been completed already. 
he would focus his efforts on improving the empire's stability which included creating a system of regional courts that would give the empire more control over its far-flung provinces. While the empire had reclaimed the territory lost to the breakaway provinces, Diocletian started expanding once again, and by the end of his 20 years, he became the first Roman emperor to abdicate his position voluntarily, retiring really? to his palace. But his successor might have had an even bigger impact. The 31-year run of Constantine the Great would be among the most successful in the empire's history. He introduced a new currency, expanded the empire's territory, and reorganized the army to be more effective. But his most significant change was his conversion to Christianity, reportedly spurred on him by seeing a cross in the sky. As the Roman Emperor converted, so did many of the citizens of Rome, igniting Christianity's rise to becoming a world power religion. At the huh? end of his reign, the empire's territory was near its peak, expanding as far east as Byzantium. After his death, wow. Constantine left the empire to his sons, starting a dynasty which would then rule over Rome. The Roman Empire looked as healthy as ever, and many people assumed that this was the beginning of a new golden age. So, how could things go so very wrong? Yeah. The year was 337 CE when Constantine passed away, and while Constantine's reign had been full of successes, there was trouble lurking under the surface. His embrace of Christianity had given the church massive power in Rome. And although many supported him in his decision, there were some who didn't wish for the empire to fall under the grasps of Christianity. Enemies of the state were executed and their estates were given to those he favored. The military was paid well, but soon the soldiers seemed to be engaging in blatant corruption. But the empire was still the greatest power in the world, and it was hard to imagine anyone challenging it. But empires aren't immune from internal strife. In the aftermath of the death of Constantine, the throne of the empire was once again open for contest, and this era led to many conflicts over who would take control. His sons initially ruled jointly, but chaos would follow, and Rome would be plunged into civil war. Many territories were taken over by local leaders, with territories going back and forth at the whims of the mm, That's also a problem when you have so much land and you give too much power to the, to the providence leaders, they'd eventually just break up on their own to try to create their own independent country. Military victories. Despite this, the core of the empire was unchallenged. And by 379, a new emperor named Theodosius had risen. A proven general, he would become one of Rome's greatest military leaders and would put an end to the era of strife. But far greater threats were brewing beyond the borders of Rome. As far-reaching as Rome's borders were at the time, it was hard to believe that a nomadic people from a continent away would throw the whole thing into chaos. But the Huns were no ordinary nomads. Fierce warriors, they'd been making inroads into Asia and Eastern Europe. And where they went, people fled. Their massive takeover of territory had led to the Gothic tribes to flee toward the Roman Empire. Suddenly, the Romans had a huge influx of barbarian warriors fleeing across their border, and Rome's lack of management in their border states came back to haunt them. A well-organized government might have been able to resettle these new residents and incorporate them into the Roman states, even using their warrior smarts to reinvigorate the military. Unfortunately, the corrupt local officials instead chose to exploit them, assuming they weren't a threat. They would be proven very wrong. Now the Romans had uh, a large so number of out the barbarians too much. Side warriors within their borders. These guests had seen Roman hospitality was lacking, and so they quickly took up arms. They were joined by other tribesmen heading over the border, and what started as a refugee crisis quickly turned into a guerrilla war. While Rome had a superior military force, it was also spread out and concentrated in the cities. And the forces that were sent to confront the Goths found the invaders fought much harder than expected. The elites felt very little of the crisis. They were kept safe in their walled cities, but across the massive expanses of the Roman countryside, the Goths quickly gained territory and claimed the land of former Roman subjects across the Balkans. And Theodosius might have neglected this problem a bit too much. Mm. The emperor may was it, a he it was his greatest downfall, I'm assuming. May have restored Rome's military in some ways, but the coffers were still looking kind of bare after decades of patronage under his predecessors. He raised taxes to confront the barbarians and was met with rebellions from the people he ruled over. He also cracked down on other faiths, doubling down on Constantine's embrace of Christianity, and even persecuted believers of other variants of Christianity. Soon he was facing new rebellions in the West, seeking to end his rule. With rebel leader Magnus Maximus declaring himself emperor in 383 and taking over the territory of Gaul. This led to significant losses in territory and troops until Maximus made a failed attempt at defeating Rome itself and was ultimately defeated in 388. Rome once again became the greatest power on the planet. But soon this would all change. By 395 CE, 
Theodosius I would die, leaving behind him a weakened army and no clear successor. His two sons would each claim the empire, but neither was a capable leader, leaving their ministers to essentially take charge of the situation. Rather than go to another brutal civil war only a decade after the last, the two halves of the empire essentially went their own separate ways. One emperor, Arcadius, took the Eastern Roman Empire, which would become known as the Byzantine Empire in the future, while the other son, Honorius, would take the western part, including Rome itself. It was the biggest loss of territory for Rome yet, and this time there would be no literally going split down the middle. I, I've always heard of the Byzantine Empire every time when I was doing like history class, but I never understood what. But they, ne but none of my teachers ever went, went into the into the reason why the Byzantine Empire was created. Now I understand why. Going back. The Byzantine Empire would never went over lasting it. another thousand years with a power base in the city of Constantinople. It would never reach the world-defining power of the Roman Empire, though. As for Rome, it still ruled much of Europe, but its days were drawing short. Without the massive territory now owned by the Byzantines, administering the empire was much more manageable, but it also meant the massive barbarian invasions were harder to control. The leader of the Huns, Attila, was one of the most feared military leaders of all time and now he placed his full attention on taking Rome. It would be a death of a thousand cuts for the Roman Empire. Over the next 80 years, the Roman Empire dealt with brutal attacks from the Huns on their fringes and the Gothic population throughout the empire. The Roman military was a shadow of what it used to be, and it frequently found itself in retreat. The territory of the empire shrunk piece by piece, and Rome started to look less like a powerful empire and more like a city in decline. Some leaders would manage to restore the military strength, but none would get it back to the level where it could reclaim significant amount of territory. The empire would limp along until 476, when one ambitious king decided it was time to strike the final blow. His name was Odoacer, and the mostly forgotten figure might have been one of the most important people in history. The last emperor of Rome, Romulus Augustulus, had a mighty name, but was only a 16-year-old boy when Odoacer invaded. The barbarian king surprisingly dealt kindly with the young king as he sacked Rome, accepting his surrender and allowing the boy to remain alive. He sent him away to live with relatives, even granting him a pension, before declaring himself the ruler of Italy, probably the most dramatic firing from a first job a teenager's ever experienced. But now the Roman Empire was over. Or was it? That depends on how you define it, because now Odoacer ruled what was left of it. But he was considered a foreign occupier. The Roman Senate didn't consider him a legitimate Roman ruler and instead transferred the seal of Rome to the Eastern Empire, so the greatest empire in history passed into legend, or did it? The Roman Empire as a government was no more, but its greatest institution still remained, the Roman Catholic Church. It was still in its infancy, less than 500 years old, but its faith had spread very quickly and would soon grow its roots in most of Europe. As the church spread, so did its power, and for the best part of the next thousand years it would be the de facto government in much of Europe. Even kings would answer to it, and few would challenge the Pope's power, until Henry VIII would start his own religion yeah. when the church wouldn't let him get divorced. So, while the Roman Empire did not control Europe anymore, the church's legacy far outlived it. But why did the empire- I've already seen a video on Henry VIII, so I already know what happens there. Empire actually fall. There's no one reason why the Roman Empire crumbled, but many factors played a role, few bigger than the collapse of its military. Rome's army was once the most powerful in the world, and it attracted the best with good pay. But as the empire's coffers declined, it soon struggled to recruit new troops effectively. This led to emperors filling out the ranks with foreign mercenaries, who neither had the skills nor the loyalty of previous armies. Many even came from the invading armies they were fighting, and the effectiveness of their fighting forces suffered. They tried to make up for the personnel problem, but that just made things worse. Many emperors consistently overspent on the military, and that didn't make it any easier to manage. The huge territory they had to govern made it nearly impossible to communicate effectively, and with no email or teams groups to share important memos, it was often a matter of weeks or months before key changes in policy were communicated. As the empire got larger and larger, this became a bigger problem, and soon the empire was more focused on protecting its key cities than effectively managing its whole territory. But inside Rome, things weren't doing much better. One of the biggest problems with Rome in its last days was the lack of strong leadership, right up to the top. Being Roman Emperor was not a great job. Given that it was an appointed position that came with near unlimited power, a lot of people wanted it, and that meant that getting the job came with massive risks. At one point, between the 2nd and 3rd centuries, over 20 men had the title in less than 75 years. And the most common way to be fired That's from the lot. job... That's a lot of people. Twenty About 20 emperors in, a, in less than 75 years? What the hell happened? was with a knife between your ribs. Turns out Julius Caesar was a trendsetter. 
When the emperor did manage to hold on to power for years, there was a good chance they would essentially turn the empire into their own personal patronage mill, appointing their allies to powerful positions, and the emperor's bodyguards, the Praetorian Guard, would often take matters into their own hands and assassinate emperors when they became more trouble than they were worth. With a government like this, is it any wonder the empire began crumbling? All of these factors came together, spelling the end for the Roman Empire. For centuries, the Roman Empire had been unchallenged on a military level, their expeditions would face little to no opposition, and their army could largely sweep into a territory and take it over as they pleased. Conquering the new territories often meant having to build new infrastructure that would increase the quality of life in the region in some ways, as well as enforcing the rule of Roman Empire on its newly acquired citizens. So the army wound up being more of an enforcement arm of the Roman government, and it was no longer prepared to deal with major military conflicts. So when the outsiders such as the Goths came calling after being pushed out of their territory by the Huns, the Roman military wasn't formidable enough to maintain- Throughout this entire video, there's always there's been a thought in the back of my head that's like, go back to playing Total Roman War. Even though I have the original game, I think about buying the original, the uh, remaster, one that they made last year. ...in its borders, and it all came down to one fatal mistake. If the military was well prepared for the invasion, odds are they could have defeated the Goth armies and defended their territory. They were better trained and had superior weaponry than the Goths, but once the Goths had managed to enter the fringes of the empire, it was going to be much harder to displace them without major military operations. The Romans ultimately chose the worst option of all. They didn't aggressively repel the Goth invaders and defend their borders, but they also didn't welcome them into the empire and take advantage of this new manpower like they could have. Instead, they exploited them and hired them while never letting them develop any loyalty to the empire. And this led to constant civil wars and small military skirmishes, growing tension and a slow but sure loss of territory. And it all could have been avoided if the empire coordinated a better response to the Goths seeking refuge within the borders of the Roman Empire. Want to learn more about the end of empires? Watch Real Reason Ancient Egyptians Went Extinct, or check out this video instead. Okay. Well, that explained a little much better than anything I've ever learned about the Roman Empire, its downfall. Literally nothing that I've ever learned. Because I didn't even know half of the Roman Empire ended up becoming the Byzantine Empire. I mean, none of my history teachers, not a single one, said it was. It used to be a part of the Roman Empire. Not a single one of my history teachers. And I had a lot of history teachers. Um, but with that being said, guys, hopefully you enjoyed today's reaction video. Please like and subscribe all that stuff, guys, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.